the three gems of the Baltic. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Proud countries with a rich history of which only a few decades were as independent as today. Part of the rural population still lives like in the 19th century, while young city dwellers are more westernized. On the call and spit at the Russian border, Lithuanian customs officials drive modern quads. But history is ever present in the Baltic states. The journey begins in Estonia. From the capital Tallinn, we cross two spectacular islands on the way to Latvia and Lithuania. Our destination is Nida on the call and spit. Estonia has over 1,500 islands. Off the coast of Tallinn lies the former smugglers' island, Ramu. And the wreck of the Josef Stalin. The Soviet passenger ship sailed into sea mines and has been rusting away ever since. Today, mainly cargo vessels and ferries ply the waters of the Gulf of Finland. At hourly intervals, they sail back and forth between Helsinki and Tallinn. Estonia orientates itself towards Finland, but its history is strongly influenced by Germany and Russia. The final order came from the Kremlin in 1991. She paints what women in Western Europe are supposed to wear one day. Reit Aus family has been living in Tallinn for seven generations. I wouldn't call myself a patriot, but when it comes to my hometown, Tallinn, I have to admit that I love this city. I never want to live anywhere else. The fashion designer is only 20 years older than her country. After the country's independence, Reik could have become anything she wanted to. The 36-year-old tailors costumes for theatre and film today, but her favourite is her own collection. She has already presented it at the Fashion Week in London. Reik represents a young Estonia. She wants to give the things that get thrown away a second life. I work mainly with recycled materials. The things that people throw away, hardly worn, and that end up in the recycling depot. Reit herself often models for her catalogues. The place where she will present her next collection is very unusual. A prison right on Tallinn's Baltic shore. In 2004, the last prisoners were released. Today, exhibitions and concerts take place in Parterai. I always do the photo shoots for my own collection at places that have something to do with me. Or in interesting places I am just discovering myself and have something to do with Estonia. Provoking in order to discover old things in a new way. Change old habits to diversify opinions. In brief, Freedom as Reit understands it, in a place where freedom was once the biggest desire. This time, Reit's daughter Nina is also in front of the camera. She as well should discover the meaning of freedom, especially by the sea, where you can stare into infinite space. You know, during my childhood, I spent most summers by the sea, and that is something I really miss when I am somewhere far away from the sea. I like going to the water and feeling its vastness and endlessness. 
kogeda seda lõpmatust. Until 1918, Tallinn had a different name, Rival. The city was founded in the 12th century by German knights and Danish traders. It was an important base of the Hanseatic League. The Soviets expanded the marine harbour of Tallinn enormously. Today it is used by scientists like Ormus Lips, the Algae researcher. With his swimming laboratory, the Saima, he sets out to sea for his research. What I personally like about the Baltic Sea is that it can be so diverse. Each time you go to the water, it is different than the last time. Ulmus is fascinated by microorganisms, which others simply think of as nasty mucus, blue-green algae. They have nothing in common with their fancy relatives in the sushi kitchen and aren't edible, but they are interesting objects of study. The scientists regularly examine the water's chlorophyll content. The more blue-green algae, the worse it is for the other organisms in the Baltic Sea, because they can be toxic. For years, the concentration of blue-green algae has been increasing. You could say that the Baltic Sea is like a well-laid table for us, because it is a very productive sea. It is good that we have the Baltic Sea and can use it. I want it to stay as clean as it is and that everybody can keep using it in the future. Every year, Due to agriculture and shipping on the sea, tons of nitrogen and phosphorus are emitted into the Baltic Sea. Just what the blue-green algae have been waiting for. From June to August, the boys record data. The concentration of blue-green algae is highest during the summer. If the Baltic Sea should become a dead sea one day, blue-green algae would be the culprit. Blue-green algae can also be dangerous for humans. High concentrations of it can have the same effect as poison and can cause allergic reactions. Ormus wants to find out why the bacteria form flourishes in certain places. In 2010, a patch of algae grew to the size of Germany. We are interested in phytoplankton since it is at the bottom of the food chain and still has the biggest amount of biomass. All life in the sea depends on the plankton. The scientists examine their samples directly aboard the Saimu. With their results, they can predict changes in the Baltic's ecosystem very precisely. When the algae die, they sink to the bottom of the sea and decompose. That process burns up oxygen that is actually needed by other animals and plants underwater. The beauty of algae lies in their variety. They can survive under the most difficult circumstances and mass occurrences of algae are observed in very different conditions. It is very surprising that there are sometimes most abundant not directly under the water's surface where there is a lot of sunlight, but in 20 to 25 meters depth. From Tallinn, the route continues toward the island Saarima. Until the late 1980s, the Soviets tested their nuclear submarines here. For a long time, Paldiski was forbidden territory. Some 1,000 Saarima horses live on Muhu, a breed that can only be found in Estonia these days. A 
Estonia is a country of moors and swamps, peat for the hardware stores and front yards of Western Europe. More than two thirds of German peat imports come from Estonia. Southwest of Tallinn is the country's largest island, Saarima. In the 14th century, a prince bishop resided at Ahrensburg. Not the most inviting abode, with almost no windows, but all the more secret passageways, trapdoors, and torture chambers. In Salima, some of Estonia's most beautiful sailing yachts are built. In the Baltic states, the hourly wages are relatively low in comparison to those on the shipyards on the northern shore. Ten businesses are already manufacturing parts or whole yachts for Scandinavian suppliers. For three years now, Maja Keller has been working as a ship carpenter at Sale Part. She's responsible for the wooden finishings. Today is her first test run. A yacht like this one is simply beautiful, elegant, luxurious, fast and sleek. Such a terrific boat. It feels great to steer it. It's also a wonderful feeling to sail on a boat that I helped build. Maya is the only woman at the shipyard. How important the seas to her becomes clearer to her the older she gets. She is now 37. My relationship with the sea began when I was a child, helping my grandparents on their boat. We also went out to sea for fishing. Boats and ships have fascinated me ever since. What Maya especially likes about seafaring is the material with which people, many thousands of years ago, took to the waves, wood. Planks of teak still adorn every sailing yacht. The precious tropical merchandise normally originates from Asia. What makes my job interesting is that you have to build everything from scratch. Nothing is ready-made. I begin with a sketch and am part of the process until the end. I think that today handcrafted boats are much nicer than mass-made ones. Every handcrafted boat is unique. Such a boat costs at least 300,000 euros. Maya's shipyard builds 10 of these per year. The buyers are mainly from Western Europe. Maya used to dream of sailing off to distant shores herself. In the end, she decided not to leave and started a family. The special thing about Sarema is that the air smells like sea everywhere. I think this smell is one of a kind. And my favorite place here is the village where my grandparents live. I spent a totally blissful childhood here. Sarema is only sparsely populated. The coast offers rare animals and plant species a possibility to retreat, hopefully for a long time to come. Sarema is also a paradise for water sports and is being discovered as such by more and more people. Estonia's coast stretches for over 4,000 kilometers. And everywhere there are remains of the Red Army fleet.
southeast of Salima lies a living museum, the island Kihnu. On the ferry to Kihnu, Marka Vaim returns from a doctor's appointment. Her headscarves give her away. Marka belongs to a people that can only be found on the island Kihnu nowadays. 17 square kilometers, reserved for 700 people with their own attire and language. A lighthouse from England even made it here in the mid 19th century. Another acquisition has also established itself here. The M72, a Soviet military motorcycle. The men from Kihnu have always been seafarers and the women had to manage all by themselves. That had a great impact on the island. The ladies call the shots nowadays, also on the motorcycle. I've spent my entire life here on Kihnu. As far as I can think, all my ancestors have lived on Kihnu. Nobody from my family comes from the mainland. Marker has three cows, 15 sheep, three kids, and an M72. The most important vehicle on Kihnu. 30 of them keep the traffic here going. This island is my home. I've also lived on the mainland when times were very tough and you couldn't find work on Kihnu. But Kihnu is my world. There is no better place on earth. Kihnu means everything to me. I don't want to travel around much or leave this place. My children are growing up here and I am very happy about that. The men of Kihnu have always been away most of the year. They used to hunt seals. Nowadays, they are only after fish. That's why the women have created their own world and have to fend for themselves. I now know this motorcycle so well that I always know which part needs repair. Our relationship is almost like that between a man and a woman. It works on mutual respect. You should treat your motorcycle like a fellow soldier who brings you home safely after a night out at the bar and serves you well. Women like Marke are called Kihnu Naina in Estonia. They're women who show that they are man enough every single day. Marke doesn't need a man in her life. She never married. But that is very unusual on the island, because in the sheltered life on Kihnu, something like that usually isn't done. Here it seems as though time has stood still, something also UNESCO has become aware of, and in the year 2003 declared the island culture as World Cultural Heritage. Marke and her friend Mayu are weaving a coat. That is the name for the typical skirt made of sheep's wool, the one every woman here wears, in summer and winter. Every stripe on the coat has a meaning. 
The more red there is, the more fun-loving its wearer is. I own 20 to 30 skirts that never get washed. Instead, we turn them inside out and wear them with an underskirt. In the past, more women than today used to wear these kihnu skirts every day, but they are very expensive. That's why nowadays some only wear them on special occasions. There is a skirt for church, one for celebrations, and another one for daily life. Even for funerals, there is a special blue kurt. Being so peculiar and independent has allowed the women and their culture to survive. Tourists come to the island to see with their own eyes how you can still live like in old times and get by just as well. From Kichnu, the journey leads us into the heart of the country, into the Soma National Park. Across lonely beaches, untouched forests, we continue towards one of Europe's most important nature reserves. Soma means land of the swamps. In Estonia's largest forest and swamp region, people have hidden from oppression and persecution again and again. In the forests, an enchanted water world is concealed. The best way to discover it is by one of the oldest transportation methods of mankind, the log boat. The Estonians call it Harbja. Nobody knows the craft as well as Ivar Huckel does, because for the last 12 years, he has been carving these boats out of a single log. Not every kind of wood works for building log boats. When searching for a tree trunk for a log boat, you have to keep a lot of things in mind. Aspens work best, and of course it must be a healthy tree. After 200 hours of work, the tree has become a boat. The best for building log boats are tree trunks with only a few branches. For 6,000 years, people have mastered this special boat building craft. Ivar Hukul discovered the waters of Pianu when he was still a schoolboy and had just moved to Soma with his parents. The national park has five seasons spring, summer, autumn, winter, and the time of the floods. After the trunk has been hollowed out, Ivar has to heat the wood up to 200 degrees. That's the only way to make it flexible. A log boat a year. Since he builds them with his bare hands, that is as much as Ivar can manage. For the National Park Guide, the century-old technique is much more than just a way to earn money. The philosophy of a log boat, I think it consists of a lot of things. While building a log boat, you think about life and the state of the world. Your own thoughts play a big role. And later, when you sit in the boat you made yourself and paddle along the river, here in Soma or anywhere else in the world, it is simply an incredible feeling. feeling. 
If the wood is smooth, Ivor expands the trunk with supporting branches. Each time he uses a longer rod, until he has created the typical form of a log boat. Ivor has recently become father of twins. He looks forward to his first trip with his children and hopes that they are as open to the water world of Soma as he is. A river is in constant movement. It has a certain speed, a rhythm. In the river, nature is livelier than it's on land. Each season in Soma has its own charm. From Soma, our route continues along the Estonian coast to Latvia and to its capital, Riga. Near the border on Latvian territory, we reach Salas Griva. In the river Zalatsa, there are 42 fish species. Among them is a very special kind, lamprey. Aina Stuntsitis is one of ten fishermen who build a complicated construction out of fir tree wood across the river each year in order to catch this sought-after delicacy. Einast and Cetus can't imagine doing any other job than hauling in the nets every day. Just like many generations before him have done here in Salazar. Lampreys have been an appreciated meal since antiquity. They behave like leeches and suck on the blood of their prey fish. Lamprey is a delicacy. Since the Latvian independence, lampreys are available to everyone. But in Soviet times, the complete haul was brought to Moscow. You couldn't buy any lampreys here. The season begins in July and ends in September. Einas and his colleagues make their own nets by hand. In order to catch lampreys, you need drag nets that can withstand the current of the river. It takes four weeks until the wooden scaffolding is in place. The fence posts are rammed into the riverbed with a hammer that weighs 16 kilos. The hardest part is to fix the posts underwater because the river is strong and can easily break the construction. We have to build the dam up again every year. In the spring it gets carried away by the ice and stream. We start from square one, posts, poles, we build everything again. That's just the way it is. Twilight is the best time to span the nets. Lamprey are nocturnal. Einar shares his equipment with three other fishermen. He is only allowed to cast his nets every fourth day. Only then can he keep the haul himself. Times change. No, no, yeah, no. 
In the good old cultures days, I earned well at sea. That's how I could afford to build a house here at the river. The sea was an important source of income for me. I had a good job. I liked the Baltic Sea. So that Einers can walk on the 800 meter long fish fence, he built a 40 centimeter wide landing stage. When Einers retrieves the nets early in the morning, he is lucky if he has caught 200 kilos of lamprey, which then have to be dragged ashore over the small bridge. The eel-like animals can reach a size of one meter. In front of his house, Einer shows his friends some samples of his hall. In a marinade of vinegar and oil with fresh herbs. deserted beaches that stretch for kilometers between Salisgriva and Riga, the biggest city of the Baltic states. The television tower with its 370 meters is the third highest in Europe. Riga's economic rise began with the Hanseatic League in the 13th century. The Petri Church was the citizens' house of worship. Riga is also famous for its Art Nouveau buildings. After years of decay, the houses are being restored to their old glory bit by bit. The central market near the old airship hangars. During the First World War, German military zeppelins took off from these halls. In the port of Riga, Signe Latze is realizing a dream that her family had for generations. Her father and even grandfather had wanted to set out to sea but they weren't allowed to follow their dream during the socialist era. Their designated profession was in agriculture. Signa's family is from Saldus, a village in the heart of Latvia. It was a long way for her to come here, to the shipping academy a year ago. Navigating, steering the course, Mooring and towing. Work aboard the Santa is the practical part of the training. The sea has always attracted me with its magic, its smell, the wind that runs through your hair, the sun in the sky. I think that this simply runs in my family. Signe is the only woman on the tugboat. 
Her mother wasn't very happy about her daughter's seafaring ambitions. Her father, on the other hand, has always supported her. After all, three years of training will give Signe a high chance of finding a well-paid and secure employment. My father wanted to become a seaman, but sadly he wasn't able to, due to political restrictions. My grandfather had also planned to go to sea, and I finally want to make this dream come true, so that my family can be proud of me. Signe and her colleagues are waiting for the ferry from Stockholm. At midsummer, they steer up to 11 ferries on a daily basis across the shoals and sandbanks of the Dolgava to the port of Riga. While entering the port, the tugboat's captain and his students are in constant radio contact with the captain of the big ferry so that the ship arrives safely at the landing pier. Signe likes it best when she can get some hands-on experience. She also likes wearing her blue overalls, almost more than her academy uniform. By now, she can even fix the motor of the dinghy by herself. I know everything that goes on on the boat, what happens in the port, all the technical stuff and operations. It is my biggest motivation to live by the sea and to work here. For me, the Baltic Sea is one of the most beautiful places in the world. In the port of Riga, especially containers and materials from Russia are loaded. It is the most important commercial port in Latvia. For 200 years, the beacon fire at the entrance leads the ship to their anchorage. This lighthouse was built in 1950. Its predecessors were always destroyed, the last one during World War II. We continue over Cape Korka to Papa. About an hour's drive from Riga is Jomala, one of the first beach resorts on this side of the Baltic Sea. Millionaires from Moscow come here just the weekend. The few remaining Art Nouveau buildings out of wood represent the beginnings of the seaside holiday. Behind Yamala lies a wonderful river landscape. Latvia has a lot of untouched lakes and swamps that have been left to their own devices for centuries. One of the most beautiful places is the Papa Nature Reserve in southern Latvia. In Smitni's 500 square kilometer workplace is not only the most spacious, but perhaps the most beautiful one in the country. Once a month, counting the wild tarpon horses is first up on his agenda. They can breed undisturbed in the nature reserve. This herd consists of 50 horses. The horses fit perfectly into this region here, and they have been living here for a long time now. They've adapted to their surroundings. They know where they find shelter in the winter when it is cold and windy, where they can drink, and where the best feeding places during each season are. 
When Ince was a child, the nature reserve was still used as farmland. Today, the horses keep the grass and the reeds short, naturally, and retain the ecological balance of the area. Ince sees the horses as colleagues, on which he has to keep an eye now and again. I can't immediately tell the horses apart and what their family tree is, but the lead stallions and the temperamental horses are easy to spot. Even rarer than the wild horses is the herd of bison and aurochs that were extinct in Latvia and have now been resettled in the nature reserve. In order to expand the practical knowledge about breeding, Ince works very closely with his colleagues from other nature reserves in Europe. Today we need to catch an aurochs that will be relocated to the National Park of Cameroon to strengthen the herd there. He will bring fresh blood to the aurochs family there. We do this so the offspring becomes stronger. By exchanging bulls, inbreeding is avoided and disease and genetic defects can be reduced. Together with the vet, Ince chooses an animal that will be sent away already today. This oryx weighs one ton. They are rarely brought down by the first shot from the tranquilizer gun. The rest of the herd flees to a safe distance. The breeding bull is still hazy from the tranquilizer, but even half asleep, he's dangerous. He would trample down anyone within his reach. It isn't the first time Ince has exchanged a bull, but each time he is happy when the bull is safely in the lorry. I chose this job because it's a constant challenge. There are only a few opportunities in Latvia to work for the protection of nature. The region and the animals here are an added incentive for me to prove myself in this field. While the Oryx is brought to its new family, Ince enjoys his evening at one of his favourite places in Papa Nature Reserve, which he helps to preserve every day with his job. The last leg of our journey leads us over the border between Latvia and Lithuania. Our destination is Nida, on the call and spit. The Palace of Palanga, built in the 19th century, today a museum of amber, the gold of the Baltic Sea. Seven thousand ships stop off at the port of Klaipeda every year. Klaipeda was founded in 1250 and called Miru, after the river of the same name, that was an important lifeline in East Prussia. Until the Second World War, one half of the population here spoke German, the other Lithuanian. Close by, the Call and Spit, created by washed up sand 7,000 years ago.
Today, the shifting sand dune belongs to the UNESCO World Heritage, a 100-kilometre-long sandbank that belongs to Lithuania in the north and Russia in the south. Kaliningrad, the former Königsberg, is nearby. The two-kilometre-long border between Lithuania and Russia runs almost exactly through the middle of the Great Dune. The Russian territory of Kaliningrad is one of a kind regarding its location, with no land connection to Russia. The bizarre sand landscape is the territory of customs official Kristina Jürgen Golite. The 22-year-old grew up in the capital Vilnius, but moved to the Call and Spit, the sunniest place in Lithuania. I remember the day I first arrived here. I immediately noticed the smell of the sea. It is a unique smell. You can find this fresh, cool air only here, and that really impressed a city dweller like me. For two years now, Kristina has kept a watchful eye on the border between the European Union and Russia. With her quad bike, she goes on patrol twice a day, on the hunt for illegal activities, and makes sure that neither alcohol nor people are smuggled across the border. The fence is not much of a deterrent. This border has more of an idyllic meaning to Christina. When I work at the beach, I also relax. You come to the sea, hear the rumbling waves. It just brightens up your day. I'd love to just sit here and listen to it. The difficult relationship with Russia is a strain on border traffic on the call and spit. Most travelers need a visa and the border patrols are vigilant. From the Russian side, there are long traffic queues. During the summer, drivers often have to wait for hours, as there is only one road across the spit and the border. The bus from Russia comes every morning and evening. This is when the nature lover turns into an unmerciful border official. The border authorities assume that despite all their efforts, two billion cigarettes are brought illegally into Lithuania every year. This is why sniffer dogs are used at the border. This Labrador has caught a number of smugglers out in the past, but today he can't find anything. During their lunch break, Christina, her colleague and her patrol dog go back to the dunes. For Christina, the scenery is never the same, unlike for many of the visitors passing through. Sheepdogs like Leo are especially trained for the work at the border. They have an excellent sense of smell, learn fast and protect their master. Leo is still young and is currently trained to apprehend illegal immigrants at the dune. 
During her break, Christina is allowed to play with Leo, sometimes doing so as a decoy. Since she has known Leo, she wants to become a dog handler herself, also because she wants to spend more time on her favourite dune. When I patrolled the dunes for the first time, I was so surprised. So much sand. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea what would expect me up here. I don't think there is any place quite like this. I don't want to go to any other country. It is so beautiful here in Lithuania. Beyond Nida come 46 kilometers of Russian coast, and then Poland already begins. The next destination on our journey along the coasts of the Baltic Sea.